All right. Welcome, everyone. This is the Employer Handbook Zoom office hour for whatever today's date. It's 136th week of quarantine. That's what I like to think of it. I guess it's February, in case someone's looking at this on YouTube. And yes, I will post this to YouTube. It'll be, I'm recording this. Don't worry about it. Um, I've got a special guest today. Well, first of all, let me introduce myself. It is my Zoom. <laughs> I'm Eric Meyer. I am the publisher of the Employer Handbook blog. I'm also a labor and employment attorney at Fisher Broyles, the first and largest cloud-based law firm in the world. I am joined today by someone very special who needs no introduction, but I'll let her introduce herself. It is Robin Shea. Hi, everybody. I'm Robin Shea, and I uh, met Eric as a fellow blogger. I'm I uh, am a partner with Constangi Brooks, Smith & Profit, and I'm in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and uh, also have the blog Employment and Labor Insider. All right. Well, thanks for joining us today, Robin, and thanks for everyone showing up. Uh, you hear that beep beep? <laughs> I'm just going to be getting people as we go along. Um, but we got a set a big agenda to hit today, but before we do that, um, let me go over some, some basic ground rules. Uh, first, everyone's muted and you're not gonna be able to unmute yourself. Um, keep your uh, video turned off because I am recording this. Uh, if you have questions, we assume that they're hypothetical questions that you're asking a friend. You're not asking for real legal advice during a free Zoom. Why would you do that? Because we're not giving legal advice. We're not creating attorney-client privilege. If you have real legal issues, call your lawyer. We're just going to say it depends a lot when you ask us, which probably what your lawyer's going to say anyway, but we can't control that. So with those ground rules out of the way, hey, Robin, given that we've been home for a long time and our work doesn't really stop, maybe we should talk a little bit about what it's like, we're both litigators, what it's like to litigate a case during a, a, a pandemic. And, and maybe let's start with what is the life cycle of many employment cases, and that is the EEOC. So for you, working remotely um, on EEOC matters. Well, with the EEOC, it hasn't made too much of a difference just because they're all working remotely too, and they have a you know, web portal where you upload your position statement and that type of thing. So um, the biggest difference I've seen since... Uh, the pandemic began was I'm getting emails from EEOC investigators now, you know, like at 830 in the evening. Uh, and they used to quit at 430 every day, no matter what. And I get these late ones and I think they're spam or spoof emails or something. And it's really legit from the EEOC. Um, the other change I've seen is uh, every mediation I've had since last March has been remote. It's been uh either by telephone or by Zoom. Now, compared to mediating in the good old days, the pre-pandemic days, where you went in in person, right? And you, you, you shook the mediator's hand and you, you, you had a joint session at the beginning where you saw um, your adversary. Do you like remote mediation as much? Is it worse? Is it better? Is it just different? What do you think? I don't like it. I, um... But I, I have to confess, what I like the most about it is being able to do some other work when the mediator is in caucus with the other side. Uh, that is wonderful <laughs> because we couldn't do that when we were live. So um, that's been good. I haven't really, you know, I think the results of my remote mediations have been about the same as what we were getting when we were doing them in person. And um, I think for everybody, at least on the employer side, it's a lot more convenient to do it remotely than to have to actually show up at an EEOC office. Heck yeah. I mean, I've done them as an advocate. I am an EEOC mediator, so I've done them as the mediator, I've done them as a private mediator. I'm with you. Uh, I think they're as effective. They take a little longer. I don't think that's because of the technology. I, in my experience, 
I mean, it, maybe people need more time to caucus with their clients a little bit. So I find that the mediations maybe go a little bit longer sometimes, but I find they're just as effective. And I really, I don't necessarily dress like this. I do put on a suit. But. <laughs> you got to look like you're taking it seriously, right? I, I wore a suit to my video mediations as well. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm going to get into uh, court hearings and you be, maybe you wouldn't be surprised when I see some adversaries wearing, I mean, it's, you got a judge, I mean, the judge is on there and people, you know, men not wearing suits and, and usually the men who, you know, they, they figure, oh, it's okay to dress down. No, yeah, not for a hearing. Yeah. I, did you read that article in this morning's ABA journal about all the crazy things lawyers and clients are doing during video mediation or video hearings, I guess. Other than appearing as cats? Besides the cat, this was in addition to the cat lawyer. Um, yeah, there were, uh, you know, people like clients who were driving somewhere during their own depositions. <laughs> so they're on the road, <laughs> I guess, with their cell phone propped up on the dashboard. Oh, no. uh, and drinking and smoking cigar, drinking alcoholic beverages and smoking cigars during a hearing. Oh my. Have, so, have you been called into court at all for any hearings? Um, I don't believe I have had a hearing since the pandemic. Um, I've got one that's scheduled for May and that is gonna be via WebEx. But uh, I don't think I've had anything else now that I think I had one court mediation that I was required to show up for in person. Oh, it mask and all that stuff. I mean, just did it. Yeah. yeah, it was at the federal courthouse and the only people there were the security people and the magistrate who was handling the mediation and uh, my client was remote and the I never did see the other side the whole time. They were somewhere at the opposite end of the building, I guess. Yeah, so so I've had several, in, I'll just use the word encounters with, with judges, both state and federal during uh, COVID. Um, never in a courthouse. I've uh, never been asked to appear in a courthouse. Um, I was supposed to have a Zoom trial, a bench trial, which would have begun I guess right around now, um, but we settled. Um, I've taken a bunch of depositions remotely, which I enjoy doing, much like mediation. I don't want to ever go back to in-person depositions. <laughs> um, but I think it, it, in terms of you, you, consistent with your experience, I think it depends on the geography of whether you're going to get called into court or not and also whether you're in state or federal court, I think may make a difference. I'm going to submit to you that a state court judge is more likely to bring you in in person than a, a federal court judge, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Well, we're the opposite in North Carolina. The state courts closed down pretty much um, yeah. and the federal courts are the ones making people show up. Someone just, someone just sent me a message privately. I won't reveal who it is. Um, they said they had a contempt hearing uh, in California. And not only did the judge make them come in, but the judge made them remove their masks. Oh. In California, oh my God. Oh. That's a shock. That's nerve wracking. <laughs> That's nerve wracking. Um, yeah, but I don't know. I mean, I, I would suspect that as we get into the summer and fall, we'll start to see a relaxing of, how do I frame this differently? We'll have more in-person stuff than with so. court ordered in-person stuff. But like I said, I mean, if I can schedule remote depositions and remote mediations and everyone's on board with that, I'm totally cool with it. Um, I mean, I, I, I get the risk in certain situations. So, I mean, if, if folks, if there are attorneys attending or if there are people who have attended depositions um, remotely have their own experiences they want to share in the chat, that'd be great. But I suppose, you know, a concern would be is if you're the, if you're the, the attorney taking the deposition, you can see the witness, but you can't necessarily see what's off screen. 
So you don't know if someone's giving the witness hand signals or you know holding up cue cards like on Saturday Night Live or something like that. But I assume most people act ethically. So outside of that, and I give instructions about when to alert me if someone comes into the room and turn off all your lights and stuff like that. But otherwise, I don't know. It feels it feels like uh, we're taking a regular deposition, except I can just do it from the comfort of my home. Yeah. You make a good point about making sure nobody else is around. I've, I had to do two pretty extensive employment investigations. This wasn't a court proceeding at all, but I was having to do interviews by Zoom and everybody was at home. And um, one of the things we did every time we talked to somebody, had them confirm that they are alone and that nobody can overhear them. Of course, they could be lying and we'd never know, but. Um, <clears throat> Hopefully having to say that on the record would uh, cause people to be a little cautious and not record things without authorization and that type of thing. Do you find that prepping people for court related events? I mean, you mentioned you had a, a Zoom media or you had a mediation where Robin, you had to go to the courthouse, but your client participated remotely. So I assume you're not meeting in person with your client in advance of the mediation to prep that person, but there is some sort of prep that goes into it, correct? Just do it over the phone, Zoom, I mean, is that? Uh, yeah, and I think in this case, this was a case that had been dragging on forever. So there wasn't a whole lot of prep and the person was in-house counsel. So we just got on the call a little early and went through what our position was gonna be. And then, um, I think actually uh, the attorney for the company did most of the talking during the actual mediation as well. And I just had to flip my laptop around. <laughs> since, since everybody was live except this attorney, um, when the attorney was getting ready to talk, I had to turn my computer around so that she was facing the magistrate judge <laughs> and, his, and his clerks. Well, yeah, the more you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. That's exciting, isn't it? <laughs> so if, let's do a little bit of a reset, folks. Thank you. You're, you are here in the employer handbook office hour. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for attending. If you have questions, please put them in the chat box down below. We'll get to as many questions as we can. Uh, we're talking litigating cases during a pandemic. Um, I guess one thing we can talk about before we close the loop and move on to handbook updates is filings. I guess there's really nothing different. It was you know, electronic beforehand. It was elect. It's electronic well, filing. Did you say? I, I yeah, electronic filing. Mean, did you you were filing electronically before the pandemic, right? Oh yeah, yeah. With federal court now, our state courts do not have electronic filing. And that has been a little bit of a logistical pain in the neck um, since the pandemic. But most of my cases are in federal court where we've had electronic filing, what, since the 90s, I think? Yeah, yeah, federal court, never an issue. I'm with you. So state court, for example, in New Jersey, if you are in superior court, um, you're dealing, you, you, we've had electronic filing for a while, but if you're in the chancery division, which is of, of so there's law division, which is, your, you know, your, your discrimination claims, your things like that. If you're in the chancery division of superior court, which is your equitable claims, like your restrictive covenants, things like that, it had been paper filing. So I was continuing to do that for a while during the pandemic, but New Jersey basically implemented a new electronic filing system during the pandemic to take into account that, you know, they don't want people having to go out and do paper filing. So, um, if, if anything, you know, I think hopefully this is getting us quicker to all electronic in all courthouses faster than we otherwise would have. You know, I hope so. Uh, all this other garbage that's been going on for the last 10 or so months. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about handbook updates. Okay. And, and we're, and we're going to try to keep it COVID free. I mean, yeah, we might slip up a little bit. I mean, <laughs> Chief to say, oh, here's what you need to update. You need to update your, uh, you know, COVID return to work policy. Yeah, we get that. <laughs> Talk about some other. 
um, that, that maybe employers aren't thinking about as much. Um, I'm going to lead off. And I'm going to say, if you don't have a specific pregnancy accommodation policy in your handbook, you're going to need one. Because the Pregnancy Fairness Act was just reintroduced in Congress and folks, it's gonna pass. <laughs> At some point, it's gonna pass. Mm -hmm. You don't have a specific pregnancy accommodation <gasps> policy in your handbook to go with your religious accommodation policy and your, I'm not, oh, my hands are below camera. Your religious accommodation policy <laughs> and your, your uh, disability accommodation policy. You're gonna need a pregnancy one too. All right, I took the easy one. Your turn. Well, that is great. You stole one of my topics, but that's okay. Um, the other, the other thing I would add to that is uh, we're still seeing a lot of companies who don't even realize that without the Pregnancy Fairness Act, um, they still may have an obligation to accommodate pregnancy and related conditions. Um, the Supreme Court came out with a decision in 2015, Young versus UPS, and said that you have to treat pregnant women the same way you would treat uh, similarly situated individuals with other medical issues. So if you would accommodate a 50 year old man who had a heart attack, uh, then you probably are gonna have to accommodate the pregnant employee as well. And so, um, I think even without the new legislation, it's a good idea to include pregnancy accommodation in your policies so that you know and everybody in your company understands that that's something you're going to at least explore and engage in the interactive process and uh, figure out whether you can do. And then, uh, yeah, we'll have a lot more specifics soon on that, won't we? It's local law, too. I mean, yeah, I'm yes. in, I was going to say I'm in New Jersey, which is now it's not the California of the East. California is the New Jersey of the West. Uh, that's what it's become. Yes, yeah. I mean, state and local law probably already require in most states um, pregnancy accommodation. Anyway, yeah. what, do you got? what else do you have besides pregnancy accommodation? Okay, this one's getting a little old, but it's less than a year, so I'm going to bring it up. If you have not added uh, LGBT, sexual orientation, gender identity uh, to your EEO policy, uh, I think most companies had that in already even before last summer, but the Supreme Court has said that um, discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity is a form of sex discrimination prohibited by Title VII. So if, you're, if your EEO policy doesn't say that, I would definitely amend it to add that. And one other thing Congress is considering now is the Equality Act, which is probably going to pass as well, and that would... Uh, as a matter of statute, give protections based on those characteristics. Yeah, I mean, unless unless there are any religious except, exceptions that arise, and I think that might be, you know, if there's a monkey wrench in the Equality Act, that might be what they're going to have to figure out. Mm -hmm. Organizations, but I agree with you, Robin, that some form of LGBT legislation uh, providing rights in the workplace is going to pass. Yeah. We're all set up for that. All right, my turn. Um, all right, I'll take another piece of low-hanging fruit here. Inclement weather. <laughs> That's better for you than us. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I feel sorry. Hopefully, folks, I mean, if you're down in Texas, I, I, I feel oh, sorry that? for you. Um, and I won't, I, I won't poke fun at all. I mean, yes, you know, we consider two or three inches up here. It's like, yeah, it's, that's nothing. But obviously, some places are just not equipped for it. And the power outages and everything that's going on, it's just awful. Um, don't make your folks come to work, <laughs> right? Um, if you're gonna shut down for a day or two or longer, you know, have a procedure in place. Um, you don't necessarily have to spell it out in your handbook, but you should know how the Fair Labor Standards Act is going to apply. You should know how FMLA applies. Um, or Fair Labor Standards Act for exempt and non-exempt employees. So something that not all of that has to be incorporated into your handbook, but a, a, a weather emergency slash business continuity slash whatever you want to call it should be in your handbook. 
That's a good one. Um, the next one I have probably ties in with our other topic, our next topic, which is uh, those of you who updated your handbooks when President Trump took office, uh, probably want to go back to your Obama era handbooks uh, because the Biden administration is going to undo virtually everything that the Trump administration did in the way of policies, um, especially in light of the National Labor Relations Act. And we're going to be talking about that in just a minute. But um, I'd say if you have an old policy sitting around that maybe you updated in 2015, you may want to get that one out and throw out the one you're using now. Good point. How about um, drug testing? So, very good. You know, I interesting. We see more states passing medical marijuana and recreational marijuana laws, legalizing either or both. Okay. Um, many employers either seeing this changing trend or seeing new laws pass or just, I don't know, becoming more is aggressive, the right word, or just like getting with the times. It's like what people do on their own time, we don't care about. I mean, okay, if you're in a regulated industry, fine. There are certain times where you have to drug test, we get it. Not saying you shouldn't, but for a lot of businesses, and I'll, and I'll stereotype it, in, a, in a, just a pure office setting, Right, no one's working around heavy machinery. Um, no one's a safety risk. We're not expecting people to show up under the influence of drugs. But what you do on your own time is fine. So they just don't have a drug policy. They don't have a drug testing policy, and that's that's fine. There's there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but if you do have a drug testing policy, whether it's at the front end as a condition of employment or after a workplace accident, you wanna make sure that what you're doing complies with the law of your state at the very least. So for example, <laughs> in Nevada, and I'm not licensed to practice in Nevada, and I'm not a big pothead. I just happen to know this because I'm an employment law nerd that you can't test for marijuana as a condition of employment. You can't. New York City, you can't. The logic is, at least in Nevada, We've legalized it here. We want people to at least, we don't say we want people to use marijuana, but we want people to have the option to use marijuana. It helps our economy. We don't want to chill that, okay? So drug testing people as a condition of employment for the existence of marijuana or THC, active THC really, is, is pointless. Um, so you want to be careful about that um, if, if you are... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in one of the few remaining states that still uh, prohibits marijuana. How about that? <laughs> so, and what we're having a problem with here is, you know, somebody in New Jersey applies for a job in North Carolina. And since we're a North Carolina employer, we require, we're still requiring drug tests that include marijuana in the, uh, what is it, the menu? Is that the right word? I don't think that is the right word, but... Um, and what happens if somebody was legally smoking pot in New Jersey and they took a drug test for a North Carolina job and failed the test because they tested positive for marijuana? And um, what I've been telling in that circumstance is, you know, if they were using it legally, according to the law of the state where they were at the time, I wouldn't penalize them for that. And I think it'll become legal in North Carolina at some point. We're always a few years behind yeah. a lot of states. <laughs> but um, in, in, in some, you know, we do have employers who still want to do drug testing and we just tell them, you know, if they're in one of the legal marijuana states, just take marijuana off the list and test for the other drugs. Yeah. I mean, under your fact pattern, Robin, you have someone who works for a North Carolina employer who is in New Jersey, however, let's assume that that employee has Crohn's disease and is prescribed marijuana, medical marijuana to treat for Crohn's disease. Um, you're going to have an issue there if you terminate that employee for testing positive because there is, there is case law in New Jersey that says that uh, Supreme Court case law in New Jersey 
that says that there's a duty to accommodate an employee's use of medical marijuana off the clock, not at work, mm -hmm. but off the clock. And, and a lot of states have that, not just in case law, but it's explicit in the statute that there's a duty to accommodate an employee's use of medical marijuana off the clock. So especially for, for multi-state employers, um, this is, it, it's, it's a pretty important issue. I wanted to ask you, there, there was a question that, that we got in advance of, of this session today, which I think it's good time to bring it up now. Robin, do you have any thoughts on post-accident drug testing? So I'm thinking more in, a, in, a, in an industrial, someone's driving a forklift, they hit someone, automatic boom, you go for, for a drug test. Do you think it's worthwhile to have it? Does it maybe in certain situations actually deter reporting of workplace accidents? Yes, it could. What I mean, nobody ever listens to me, okay? So let me just preface what I'm about to say with that. Uh, clients never listen to me about this. My belief all along has been, uh, you know, post-accident testing is legal. I recommend you do it only if you have reason to believe that, uh, some type of controlled substance might have resulted in the accident and the person you're testing is probably at fault in the accident. Um, the example I always use is, you know, you have some person walking across a production floor minding his or her own business and they get mowed down by a forklift going 60 miles an hour. Uh, I would definitely do a post-accident test of the forklift driver, but I don't think it's right to test the person who was walking on the plant floor doing nothing wrong. And um, I think that might help a little with the deterrent effect. And I also like the idea of, you know, don't test everybody. The fact that this person got mowed down is not their fault. It's, you know, if they were taking anything, you know, that probably wasn't relevant to the accident anyway. Um, but like I said, I've, I've got a lot of clients who say, thank you, Robin, you know, please shut up and we're going to test everybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think one of the issues too that, that I've encountered with clients is they say, well, Eric, how do we know if someone tests positive for marijuana that was actually in, that it was actually, they were under the influence at the time. And the answer is generally you don't. Like if you're taking uh, a um, saliva test, you're not going to know, right? It's got to be active THC. That's what shows whether someone's under the influence or not. Um, and good luck finding a drug, a drug testing company that's, gonna, that's going to commit to giving you accurate tests for someone who's under the influence of active THC. Good luck. If you find one, put, put it in the chat window below because I'm still trying to find that company. I get the question a lot from clients. Um, uh, it's your turn. Do you have any others uh, for... Uh, Policies? Are, are we still on policies? Yeah. Or we can do. We can do. Yeah, we'll do like one more policy, and then it'll be twelve thirty, and we'll click over to national relations. <laughs> Actually, I think I was at the end of my list. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, I'm gonna cheat. Okay. I'm gonna cheat. I, I will bring up code. All right, and, then, and not return to work, and not like having you know six feet apart and masks in the workplace. But this is kind of quasi COVID, so. Any, with any remote work, right? You wanna have good time tracking policies, especially for your non-exempt employees if they're doing work remotely. Um, and you wanna make sure that employees understand their overtime policy. You probably have a lot of this stuff already, but it may not be specific to remote work. I'll bet your, I'll bet your handbook says something like, Non-exempt employees aren't allowed to work overtime except without the advanced written permission of a supervisor. Yeah, okay, but well, remind them of that. You know, that's important. This, that's more important than ever, right? Do you want non-exempt employees? Robin gave the example earlier of EEOC sending her email at eight o'clock at night. Do you want your non-exempt employees checking and sending emails at eight o'clock at night? Is something that important? Like if you email them after hours, do you want them responding to you right away? Or do you want them to wait until the traditional nine to five the next day? If it's the former and it's one or two emails, no big deal. There's what we call a de minimis exception 
in the Fair Labor Standards Act, where if you, you know you spend a minute or two checking emails, that's not going to add up. But if someone's checking emails every night, and that's adding up, and that's adding up, and all of a sudden you tick over 40 hours worked in a work week, and you're not exempt, you owe overtime. And you need to also have proper mechanisms in place. The Department of Labor talked about that um, recently. I, I think this guidance is, hasn't been withdrawn yet, um, but, but you have to have- It will be. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for right now, if the employer has good mechanisms in place, now I'm saying it in our, I forget what the term of our, but a procedure in place where employees know how to report their time and they don't take advantage of that well-known, easy to use, publicized procedure, then the employer is not responsible for paying for that time work, right? It's like, I, I don't know, I don't have to pay for it. But if you make it hard for employees to report their time um, or you somehow impede them from reporting their time, you still have to pay for it once you learn about it. Um, you can discipline employees for violating your rules, but you still need to pay. So having good overtime rules and having good time tracking rules, very important. All right. Now, we were talking about things are going to change during the Biden administration. Um, you were already seeing it at the Department of Labor. There were two um, wage and hour letters that were uh, opinions that were uh, withdrawn today. Um, and we're definitely going to start to see it at the National Labor Relations Board. Not just yet, because the Republicans still control the board. Um, but once the first Republican steps down and President Biden names a Democrat to replace, we're going to see a lot of uh, rolling back. The pendulum is going to shift again, back to Obama. What are some of the shifts, Robin, you think that we're going to see at the National Labor Relations? Well, I think the biggest uh overall topic is going to be these employment policies that, uh, you know, for years during the Obama administration, we were advising employers get rid of these policies or tone them down or do, do something because the Obama board was taking the position that they have a chilling effect on employees exercise of their rights under Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act, which just says that employees, all employees, whether they're union or not, have the right to act together, uh, you know, in support of their positions on terms and conditions of employment. So it's very vague, very general, and it applies to everybody who's not at a supervisory level or above. And uh, some of the policies, if you recall, uh, those of you who were in HR or uh, legal back in the Obama days, were uh, social media policies. Uh, employees, employers who were strict about what employees could say on social media because they were afraid that it was going to adversely affect the company's reputation. That was one of those things that uh, employers were not allowed to restrict. And uh, the best case I remember of that was from New York and it involved, uh, Eric, I know you know this one where um, somebody posted on, he was mad at his supervisor and he posted on Facebook, F him and F his family, um, yeah, here, here. go union. And then he added go union at the end. And uh, the NLRB under President Obama, as well as the court in New York found that he had engaged in protected activity um, and that it was unlawful for the employer to terminate him. So social media policies uh, would be one. Uh, workplace civility rules, um, <laughs> which we want because that helps with keeping a harassment free workplace. But uh, the prior or the Obama, two priors, uh, the Obama administration had said that civility rules might violate the NLRA. Eric, I'll let you have a turn. Yeah, I, I wanted to get into what's been a touchy area. Um, at least in the last six or so months, and that is this friction between Section 7 rights that Robin just referred to. So the right to form a union or not form a union, or at the very least, the right to discuss working conditions with one another in an attempt to improve workplace 
the workplace. Okay, so those are your section seven rights. But what happens if those rights butt up against EEO laws? Like just the right to be free from discrimination. So there were a, a bunch, I think the, a, a trinity of cases where um, uh, we were having, there were picket lines and there were all sorts of racist stuff being said on the picket lines, all in the name of section seven rights. <laughs> and the National Labor Relations Board at the time took the position that section seven rights, no, no pun intended, trump the, the, the EEO, the, your, your, your EEO rights. And the National Labor Relations Board said, no, that, 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 that's ridiculous. You're right. We can't have people discriminating against each other just because they want to improve working conditions. You put the employer in, a, in an untenable position, right? If you discipline someone for engaging in this really harsh, uh, discriminatory Section 7 behavior, then you're going to have a problem with the National Labor Relations Board. If you don't, and this behavior repeats itself, now you're going to have a problem with the EEOC. So which is it? So it looked like the EEOC and the National Labor Relations Board were agreeing, or at least starting to agree, that federal employment laws would control. And look, you can, you can engage in certain behavior to improve working conditions, but you can't use ethnic slurs to do so, right? You can't use sexist language to do so. I don't know if that's going to be the case going forward. I don't either. I don't know where they're going to strike that balance. And I think they didn't really achieve a balance till the Republicans got onto the NLRB. Um, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong about that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen with that? But that is definitely a policy I'd be wanting to take a look at um, and see whether we need to change it or go back to our 2015 version of it. Hypothetically, I'm not giving any sort of legal advice to anyone here, right? Go consult your own lawyer. But if it were my business, right, and I had the choice between do I, do I follow Title VII or do I follow the National Labor Relations Act? I know what I'm following 10 times out of 10. And I'll take, I'll take my lumps with the National Labor Relations Board if I have to later on. But I'm gonna, ha I'm gonna follow my anti-harassment policy to the left. And someone engages in that sort of behavior all in the name of you know, Section 7 rights, they're gonna get disciplined up to and including termination of employment. Yeah. What's gonna happen? Uh, how about, think about workplace investigations? So oh, that's another yeah. one where uh, it got a lot easier during the last administration. It's probably about to get harder because, um, and, and this may be another one where, as Eric said, you wanna just take your chances with what is more protective of employees, but the board under the Obama administration had said that it might not be all right in conducting an employment investigation like a harassment investigation to ask employees to keep things confidential and that they might be able to go out and talk about your their interview with other people. Um, I don't like that, uh, but I think it's possible we will be going back to that under the Biden administration. I would say this. I think the reality is that if people are involved in a workplace investigation, whether you are the victim, the alleged harasser, or a witness, as the employer, I think you're going to have to expect it. It's, you know, it's not something that's real easy to just kind of keep the lid on. So if you have a rule that says strict confidentiality as part of a workplace investigation, you better be prepared to enforce it and enforce it consistently. I think in Robin's right, what we'll see as part of the Biden administration, the Biden board, is that you'll be able to get away with recommending to people or expressing a preference 
to people that take place that, that take part in the investigation that they not share the information, but to insist upon keep your mouth shut or you're gonna lose your job. I think that's gonna violate the national labor rules. I think that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And I know when I'm conducting an investigation, I would never put it that bluntly anyway. I, you know, I'm always, we really think it's important to keep this confidential. We appreciate you're not talking about it to anybody and leave it at that. But that might arguably be a violation if the standard changes back. I think, the, I think as big an issue will be people recording these interviews. Um, I've encountered that, or I've interviewed, it, it having, having nothing to do with, with the National Labor Relations Board or mm -hmm. I, I place investigations where I've asked people, are you recording this? And they say, oh, am I not supposed to? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, that may be an issue that crops up too, the ability of someone to record a witness interview. Yeah. So, now, I guess for people in two party consent state, it, my state, and I guess, I don't, I'm not sure about New Jersey, Eric, but in North Carolina, only one party recording a conversation has to consent to the recording. So uh, there's no limit, you know, if I wanna do it, I don't have to ask anybody, I don't have to tell anybody what I'm doing. It's legal for me to record. And so we always take kind of a, we're fairly laid back about recording as well and just try to remind people, just realize you may be recorded when you're doing this and conduct yourself accordingly. But, um, you know, a lot of states do have two party consent. And uh, in that case, the recording may be illegal under state law. In Even New Jersey, we are one party across the river in Philadelphia, two party. So when someone from Philadelphia is having a conversation with someone from New Jersey, kind of depends on who's doing the recording. I've had to research this three times for clients. Um, but yeah, you're right, you're right. Isn't that what happened with Linda Tripp and Monica Lewinsky way back when? One of them was in a, I guess one was in Virginia and the other was in DC or Maryland. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Anything else you think folks should look at? look out for at the National Labor Relations Board, at least in the short term. Otherwise, we've got some good questions we can get to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The only thing I would just reiterate is that these rules we're talking about are not just for union employers, uh, even though they're coming from the NLRB. They apply to all employers. Yep, that's true. That's true. Um, unless, I guess, unless you're in the, in the public sector. True, uh, yeah. You, you know, but you may have your well, own basically National Labor Relations Act set of rules. Um, but yeah, for most employers in the private sector, union or not, you are covered under the mm -hmm. National Labor Relations Act. Well, we got a bunch of good questions submitted in advance. And if you have additional questions, folks, please throw them up in the chat down below. Um, first question I had, and this was, this was a long email, which I, I, I compacted down to a single sentence question. Robin, do you have some tips for combating unemployment fraud during the pandemic? Oh, that, that is a really good question. And um, it, you can say it, we all say it. It depends, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, the unemployment cases I've had post pandemic involved some people who, uh, they weren't committing fraud. They just said that they stopped coming to work because they felt that the employer was not safe enough. And we won both of those cases because we were able to show that we were complying with everything that was required at the time. Um, in the worst scenario, and one of them was uh, somebody was eligible for two weeks. They were uh, not disqualified for a period of two weeks, but then they were disqualified for the rest of the period because the employer couldn't get masks immediately. Um, but as far as fraud on uh, COVID, 
it's going to depend so much on the circumstances and what the alleged fraud was. I would just say investigate it thoroughly the way you would any other claim, whether it's a claim in a lawsuit or, or a, uh, an unemployment claim. There may be some evidence, you know, of course, with an unemployment claim, you can't engage in discovery and get all their emails where they were saying, you know, woohoo, I feel great. I'm not sick. I haven't been exposed, but I'm telling my employer that I'm not able to go to work. Uh, you're not going to be able to get that kind of evidence for an unemployment claim, which you might be able to get in the event of a lawsuit. Um, but, you know, do the best you can. And uh, there may be some indications through emails, you know, communicate with the company um, that give you reason to believe there was fraud. Um, you know, beyond that, I, I don't think there would be anything necessarily definitive that would apply in every case unless the person just admitted they were faking. We have had some people who refused to come back to work when jobs were offered to them because they were making more money on unemployment. And um, that's easy to prove because there's usually their witnesses and there may even be written communications where the person turned down an offer to come back to work for that reason. And we're waiting anxiously. I am for the Department of Labor to issue guidance on what President Biden wanted the Department of Labor to do, and that is situations in which an employee feels that it's unsafe to come to work, Yes, person can choose not to come to work and collect unemployment. So that's a situation which I, I, I am really, it's not like, like, it's not in the same way, like, I can't wait to watch the next episode of WandaVision, but if you haven't watched WandaVision, it's really good. Like, I really can't wait to watch that. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I'm anxious <laughs> to see what the DOL has to say um, about, uh, about that. I am too. And I've, I feel like we probably would have lost the cases we won earlier. The, my cases were during the Trump administration and under those rules. But I'm afraid that maybe now we would have lost those cases that we won where the employees didn't feel safe coming back. I see there's a little chat going on uh, right now about folks who are, I mean, like some real fraud action, people who are sending in claims on behalf of other employees, including HR and the president of the company. So that's something you want to, you want to be bullish about, about fighting. Robin, what publications besides the employer handbook and labor and employment insider would you recommend for an hr department of one to review to consult before calling outside employment how do you save a buck or okay two? well it, it's so hard to answer that because you've already ruled out the two best sources possible but um one, one place I would recommend, and, and of course, you, this is a paid, this would require a paid subscription, is the SHRM website, the Society for Human Resources Management. Uh, they are very up to date. You do have to buy an annual subscription, um, but I think it would be well worth it, especially if you're a one person HR department. Um, they will have very good updates. They also do articles, and I'm sure they interview Eric. They have interviewed me, um, you know, for articles about various employment law topics. They're very up to the minute. So that would probably be my first recommendation for a one-person HR department. I would say, okay, I'll, I'll throw a couple. I would say uh, Job Accommodation Network, Jan, askjan.org, great one for anything to do with disabilities and accommodations. EEOC, pretty good resource there as well. I mean, even Department of Labor, um, National Labor Relations Board, that website's a little bit wonky to, to navigate. Um, uh, I, oh, what, what blogs do I read? Um, we've had John Hyman on here before. He's got the Ohio Employment Law blog, awesome. Um, who doesn't read FMLA Insights by Jeff Novak? Great one for FMLA. Um, and uh, there's a couple of other ones that I'm, I'm probably just forgetting as well that are, that are really good. Um, I mean, a lot of law firms have, have, have pretty good employment law blogs as well. I mean, Cypher Shaw has a good one. Littler, 
uh, Jackson Lewis. I mean, I'm not, you know, look, I, this is where I get a lot of my fodder for, for blocks too. And Stangy, obviously. Um, so there's, there's plenty of, plenty of um, places to, to get information. Mm. And I'd like to second what Eric said about the government websites. Those are really pretty good. Um, the EEOC website has great information. Um, it, all of it's free. <laughs> the Department of Labor has good information. They have their own OSHA sub website and OFCCP for those of you who are federal contractors. So those are good sources for up to the minute. The trouble with bloggers, we are free, which is great. Um, and we're extremely entertaining, um, but, you know, depending on what's going on in our lives, we may have something up, whether we're interested in it or not, we may or may not blog about it, uh, whether it's within our area of expertise, we may or may not blog about it. So I, I think it's good to have some other sources beyond the law blogs, even though I definitely think the law blogs are awesome, <laughs> if I do say so myself. <laughs> Good. Although, I, candidly, every once in a while with my blog, you get what you pay for. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. All right. We got about two minutes left. Let me pick out. Let me see. One, oh, there was a question that came in this morning um, that I want to get to. Uh, you know, when, when you queue up in advance of the Zoom session, you, you, get, you get the advantage of getting your question answered. So, this one came in right at the buzzer today. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about Pregnancy Fairness Act. And this is a question about pregnant accommodate, accommodations for pregnant employees who work remotely. Um, and I remember, I don't have all the, there were a couple of questions in the email, but one of them had to deal with you know, the sensitivity of you know, interfering with or imposing upon someone who is you just gave birth, you want to be accommodated, but you don't want to interfere. Maybe they're on FMLA. How do you, how do you accomplish that as the employer? Is that a mouthful? Yeah. Uh, you know, as far as accommodating a pregnant employee who's telecommuting, the only thing I can think of that would be an issue would be, you know, maybe if she has to take a break for morning sickness or, you know, to stretch her back out if she's in the late stages of pregnancy. But I can't think of a whole lot else that would be necessary. You know, so, so I think the big thing there would be make sure uh, she understands to accurately post her time and if she takes a break, post that, but also post if she works long, you know, late into the night to make up for maybe missing some time during the business day. And that's only if she's not exempt. If she's exempt, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but just remember also with exempt people, if they do any work during the work week, you owe them for the whole week in most cases with some very limited exceptions. So that's the problem with exempt people. With non-exempt, it's just getting them to post their time accurately. But yeah, I wouldn't know of a whole lot else uh, with a pregnant employee who was working from home that would be- To this show. though, for, for FMLA, right? If someone is FMLA eligible after they give birth, so for bonding time, they don't have to take the FMLA leave right away. They can if they want to. I mean, that's usually natural, the woman who gives birth might need, you know, would want the time right away. You can take that bonding time really any 12 weeks up to a year old. So it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be right away. Um, if most people take it in a continuous block of leave, which is fine, you don't need employer permission for that other than just filling out your FMLA. Right. If you want to take that bonding leave intermittently, at least under the FMLA, you do need employer permission. Right. In a remote working environment, I assume most employers are just going to say, do what you need. Do what you, we're not worried about FMLA. Just do what you need to do. Yeah. Enough people yeah. have problems with, with, with you know, remote school and all that stuff. We're not going to give you a hard time about taking care of your new um, But that's at least what the FMLA. That's true. And, and I would say also, if, if you are going to let somebody work intermittently for baby bonding FMLA leave, uh, I would want them to at least track the time they're using, you know, 
as accurately as they can. And I realize that can be difficult if you get interrupted by a baby while you're in the middle of something. And, you know, you may not remember to post exactly the seven and a half minutes you were tending to the baby, but um, for the most part, you know, ask them please document the time they're using as FMLA so that that can be counted against their 12 week total. Um, and, you know, they may also be entitled to PTO for that or some other type of paid benefit. Robin, we hit the top of the hour. Uh, we did. It time flies. <laughs> so much. Folks, Robin Shea, employment lawyer, management side employment lawyer extraordinaire, publisher of, well, I guess Constanzi's technically publisher, but 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 the, the, the lifeblood of the <laughs> labor insider i posted a link to the blog um i'm going to post it when i upload this to youtube i will post all of robin's information up there you should connect with her on linkedin should subscribe to her blog if you're in north carolina am I, am I allowed to promote you i guess i can promote you right like if you're in north carolina if you got legal issues consider giving robin a call uh, folks this was uh thank you all for for, for coming out um I hope you like these uh, these Zoom sessions. I hope you like our special guests. I'm trying to line up some some other folks too, maybe from the EEOC, uh, maybe some other uh, subject matter experts. If you have suggestions of who you'd like to see, please drop them in the text in the chat box. Email me, whatever. Everyone, thank you. Stay safe, and have a great weekend. Talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody. And Eric, thank you. Bye.